go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming today. Isn't it good that we're finally getting some rain? Yes. We, we desperately need it, so uh, maybe, maybe it's going to be kind of one of those all-day rains, which is what we really need. <laughs> yeah, it was nice that the grass kind of slowed down, but, uh, but you know, I know the farmers need it, and we need to eat, so Amen. It's, uh, everything is a blessing from God, so we're thankful for the rain today, and we're thankful that you're here this morning. Uh, so if you would, turn in your songbooks to number 299. Number 299, we're going to sing this song, and then uh, Brother Maurice will lead us in an opening prayer, and then we'll have our class. Uh, let's try to sing all three verses. This is a pretty short song anyway. <laughs> it kind of fits with our, every. I mean, every day we talk about Jesus, but our, our sermon this morning, we're going to really focus on him. So, so 299, I've decided to follow Jesus. All three verses, let us sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, I'll follow him. Brother Maurice. Shall we pray? Father oh God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to hear more about how Jesus entered Jerusalem and how he was received and, and the things that happened. Well, it's good to be back with you all. I missed you all Wednesday night. We had, well, thank you. We had a good, uh, well, I think we had a good BBS. I don't know what everybody else thought, but uh, I was teaching vacation Bible school at Eastside, the, the adult class, and so I taught it all week, Monday through Friday, so whew, it was a busy week. Uh, but a very profitable week and uh, good for me. Had to do a lot of studying to teach those things. And so it's a good week. And had pretty good crowds. And so hopefully people benefited from it. But uh, I did miss you all Wednesday night. Uh, Danny Rogers told me Tuesday night, he was there, of course, in the adult class. And he said, you know, he said, I just think I've learned all I've learned from you. I'm not coming tomorrow night because he was coming up here, you know. So, I said, are you going to lay out? He said, yeah, I'm just going to lay out. I'm not coming. So he, he filled in for me, so I'm grateful for that. But I'm glad to be back among my church family. So good to see you all. So 
If you would be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. So we were looking at the first 12 verses. Uh, and we got, I'm sorry, the first, uh, let's see, where did we cut that off? The first 17 verses, yeah, that's what we were looking at. We're on verse 12. So we got through most of that. We were talking about Jesus uh, coming into Jerusalem. And this is the, the last week of his life. We talked about all the people who greeted him and, and uh, recognized him as God, Son of David, saying, Hosanna, you know, save us, we pray thee. And, we looked at all those things, and so we finished off last time. We looked at verse 12, and then we, we also read Mark 11, who also gave uh, this account. Uh, but let's go back and let's read verses 12 and 13. We already had some discussion about this, but I want to go into an explanation of why these people were doing what they were doing. Totally wrong, but, you know, you, why would they be there doing it? Well, we're going to look at that. So verses 12 and 13, Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so we talked about the fact that Jesus was very upset and he kicks these people out and overthrows the table. And so what does that tell us about uh, the people that say, well, a Christian cannot get angry? Can. We can't. Yeah. Jesus never sinned, but yet he was really angry. Okay? So there is such a thing as righteous anger. And so we have to stand up for God. So anytime somebody doing things against God, it is not sinful for us to get angry about that. We ought to be angry. We can't just take it and go, oh, well, that person's very anti-God, but that's okay. It's not okay. So those are things we should be upset about. Being angry can be a sin if we get angry about the wrong things or, again, if we let our temper get way out of hand and we hurt people. And Yeah, those are kind of sinful activities, but it doesn't mean that every time you get mad, that's necessarily wrong. Jesus did it, and he's our perfect example. So let's talk about, well, why are these people... Uh, of all places, why are they in the temple buying and selling? I mean, can't they do that in the marketplace? And why would they be here anyway? Well, remember that this is during the Passover. So a lot of people, of course, live in Jerusalem, but everybody came to Jerusalem from the surrounding countryside for the Passover feast. And so there were a lot of out-of-towners that didn't necessarily live in Jerusalem, but they they come a long way and they live in all these different you know, provinces surrounding the area. And so back then, they didn't necessarily have a uniform currency, a uniform money. Okay? Uh, so a lot of people may not realize that when we fought the Revolutionary War against the British and we first established our country, did you all know that each state had its own money? Did y'all know that? Yes. Well, didn't, one, didn't one state try to use British money? Uh, they tried for a little while, and they wanted to switch to their own. And, but they all had their own money. And so, yeah, North Carolina money wasn't any good in South Carolina. And Connecticut money could not be spent in Massachusetts. Right? And so it really hindered the trade. So eventually we decided, you know what, we, we need one currency for everybody. And the states would pass laws, you know, making it harder for people to trade in their state with money from another state. And so, same thing here. You had different currencies from these different areas. And so, the people that came in from out of town, they needed to exchange their currency, just like you and I would today, you know, if we were traveling to France or, or Germany or wherever, we would need to change our American money into you know, French France or, or what have you. Or we were just, you know, when we went on the last cruise, uh, we went to Canada and we didn't really buy anything uh, because we were only there for a few hours. But if we had, we would have needed really to change the money because 
if you pay, they'll take American money for their stuff up there, but you're paying more than if you pay Canadian money. So it's a good idea to exchange your currency. Uh, you get more value for it if you do that. So these people were here, they needed to exchange their currency. Okay? And so they were, because they were gonna have to pay the temple tax. And we've talked about that before, that there was a temple tax. And so they, the only way you could pay that was in the currency used by Jerusalem. So the currency out in these outlying areas, they didn't want to accept that. So you had these money changers, just like a modern bank today, and they would exchange your currency. You could cash in your whatever money you had for Jerusalem money, so then in turn you could pay the, the temple tax. So that's why they were there. And then they also, a lot of these people would come in and they didn't want to bring animals with them. They needed to sacrifice animals. And so there were people there selling the sacrificial dove. You know, you could buy doves and sacrifice them for the Passover. Uh, and so they would uh, get the money for the tax. They would buy the sacrificial animals, the doves being sold. Now they were doing this in the Gentiles court, what, what they called the Gentiles court which was just outside the inner temple, but it was inside the temple walls. So technically it was part of the temple. And that's where they were doing it, uh, I guess, because they thought, well, this is, it's convenient. People are gonna go in and sacrifice so we can change the money here, we can sell the doves here, and they can buy what they need. So what they were doing was a necessary service. So what's the problem? Yeah, it's where they were doing it. It's not what they were doing. It's where they were doing it. Again, that should have been taken, uh, taken care of in the marketplace. Like Jerusalem had a big marketplace. That's where that should have been done, not in the temple, not in the house of worship. That's why Jesus, you know, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've turned it in to a den of thieves. Now, if, if they're doing a legitimate business, they're just doing it in the wrong place, what does it indicate when Jesus calls them a den of thieves? What do you think's going on there? They're, they're taking what they're, they're uh, stealing. They're stealing the, the very area that should be reserved. For they're stealing. They are doing that, but he's actually talking about the money here. What do you think they're doing? They're selling animals for sacrifice. They are but they're thieves. The guy selling the doves, he's a thief. Well, sometimes we might say that. We go buy something and play, you're a thief, man. What does that mean? Oh, <laughs> you're charging me way too much. And the people changing the currency. Jesus is accusing you're ripping people off. Okay, yeah, this is necessary to do, number one, but you're doing it in the wrong place. And number two, you're ripping people off. You're overcharging. Doves were worth very little because they're very tiny birds, right? So they, they didn't, typically they didn't cost very much. Sometimes people would buy them to eat and that kind of thing. And so when everybody, it's just like now, right? If, uh, if a town is having some kind of a convention, there's a sales convention, right? And all these people, what happens to the price of the hotel rooms? They gouge them, right? They jack them up. Right, or, and, and the gas stations typically the price of gas in town will go up, and you know everybody gouges all these visitors coming in from out of town when they really shouldn't do that, right? So Jesus, that's what he's saying. Not only are you doing this in the wrong place, but you're stealing from poor people because you're way overcharging them. You could still make a profit and charge them a lot less, but you're gouging these poor people because you know they have to buy the doves. They got to have them for the sacrifice because God has required that. So you are taking advantage of that. Okay, so Jesus is kind of, uh, he's mad because of where they're doing it. And he's also mad because they're, they're basically stealing people. All this fraud was going on there uh, in the temple. Now, this was the second time that we know of, at least that was recorded by Matthew, the second time that Jesus cleansed the temple. Uh, the first time was three years earlier, and I think we looked at that before. That was in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. We're not going to go back and read that today, but that was an earlier time where Jesus had 
cleared people out of the temple that were doing stuff they weren't supposed to be doing in there. Okay, uh, so what that demonstrates is that he didn't do it more than once. And this has been a problem before, and so Jesus comes in again and he clears them out. What do you think that says about you know they're letting all these activities go on in? The house of worship that shouldn't be going on what does that tell us about the spiritual state of israel very very poor, very poor right uh, they just they didn't care these things should not have been allowed to happen it, it shouldn't have to be up to jesus to come in and cleanse the temple that kind of stuff should never be going on if you take the house of worship seriously Right? And so Jesus really, he is rebuking the nation of Israel for their sorry spiritual state. You, you've turned this into, again, like a den of thieves. This, this is just any ordinary place. There's nothing special about it. There ought to be something special about it, but there's not. So you guys are not taking God seriously like you should. You think you can just do anything in here. Uh, there, there's nothing sacred about it. So they just, they were showing an utter disregard for the sacredness of the temple. And gee, that's what Jesus is angry about. And we should be the same. If, if people were showing a disregard for God or for his law, we ought to be angry and upset about that. There's nothing sinful uh, about it. So then in verse 13, when he says this, you made it a den of thieves, Jesus is quoting uh, from the Old Testament where this had been predicted, uh, Isaiah 56 and verse 7 and then Jeremiah 7 and verse 11 both mention this. And so Jesus is referring back. Uh, notice he says in verse, thing, verse 13, it is written. Whenever Jesus says that, what's he referring to? The, uh, scriptures. the scriptures. Yeah, what, what we call the Old Testament. He's referring to the scriptures. It is written. In other words, God said do this or don't do that, whatever it was. So anytime you see that, when Jesus said it is written, that's what you know he's quoting something or referencing something from the Old Testament scriptures. And that's where, so that comes from Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah. And then we see in verse 14, and the blind and the lame came into him in the temple and he healed them. Okay? So everybody that comes in, Jesus heals them. So compare that to what the money changers were doing, what the merchants were doing in there. This is a contrast of what is Jesus doing? By him healing people, what's he doing? He's demonstrating his power. He's demonstrating his power. Is he doing it for himself or to help others? To help others, right? What about the money changers and the, the merchants? Are they doing it to help other people? Themselves. No, they're helping themselves, right? So you see a contrast here. Jesus is saying the temple ought to be about serving God and helping others. You guys are in here for selfish reasons, uh, you know, taking care of your own interests for your own profit, your own economic gain. And so Jesus contrasts that with this is what you ought to be doing in the temple is serving others. Okay? And so we see that, uh, the contrast. And then uh, verses 15 and 16. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were thrilled, right? Is that what it says? They were sore displeased. They should have been thrilled. I would be. Jesus walked in here and started healing people. I'd say, oh, this is, this is wonderful. This is great. This is amazing. They're really upset about this. Don't do that. Right? So they're sore displeased. They're really. Now, this is an unrighteous kind of anger. This is sinful anger. So they're mad at Jesus because he's doing the will of God. He's doing what God wants, and they're mad about that. Nobody has any right to be mad about that, but they are, right? And so the children are crying in the temple, the Hosanna to the son of David. Remember, Hosanna is, you know, save us, we pray these, what that means. 
We said the, the day before when Jesus came into Jerusalem, that's what everybody was saying, acknowledging he's the Messiah, he is the Son of God, and they believe that. And then they call him here the Son of David, which always refers to who? The Jesus always refers to the Messiah because he's of the lineage of David. So anytime you see that Son of David, it's always talking about the Christ. Right? So that's who they recognize him to be. Uh, and so the scribes, and you know, they're really upset about this, and they want Jesus to rebuke those people for calling him the Son of God and <laughs> praising his name. But you need to tell them to stop doing that. What? But that's what they're telling him to do. And he will not, of course, he's, he's not going to do that. Uh, and in verse 16, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? So we said, whenever he says it is written, this is another phrase, have you not read? Again, what's he referencing? If he asks somebody, did you not read? Have you not read? Read what? The Bible, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Have you not read the scriptures? So once again, anytime you see that phrase, he's quoting scripture. Okay, so the Pharisees, they want him to rebuke them, and he quotes Psalm 8 and verse 2, just in case you're curious. That, that's what he's quoting there when he talks about the mouths of bays and sufferings. Okay, and so Jesus, of course, he's not going to rebuke them because they're not doing anything wrong. So there's no reason to rebuke them for it. But the Pharisees, they realize they're losing their grip on a lot of these people. They, they just don't like it. So then in verse 17, and he left them and went out of the city into Bethany and he lodged there. And so we noticed that uh, that Jesus, this is where he was staying. This was a suburb that's roughly about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And so he is going, Jesus will lodge there every night, the last night of his week, except of course Friday night, which is the night he's betrayed. But Saturday, basically Saturday through Thursday, that's where he's going to stay, is in Bethany. So every day he goes into the city, he's going to teach people, and then at night he goes back into Bethany. That's where he's staying. All right, so that brings us to the next part then, where this is kind of interesting uh, that sometimes people... Again, if you just read it, you might not really understand it. You've got to kind of study a little bit and see what is the meaning here. What, you know, what's he, everything Jesus does, it's a teaching moment. He's trying to get his apostles and you and me, he's trying to get us to learn something about what he does. And sometimes it seems kind of harsh. Wow, why, why would he do that? But there's always a lesson in what he does. So this is uh, where he curses the fig tree. All right, so let's read verses 18 through 22 and then see what we can learn from that. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Okay, so there's, there's room for misunderstanding in these verses. So let's look at this. So first of all, about the fig tree. Remember, they're in Palestine, of course, and so you you need to know a little bit something about the geography of the and the temperature and the climate, the growing season, all that kind of thing. Which again, the people in the first century they would have understood all this. We have to do a little bit of research to to get it. But fig trees, they typically they would put out their fruit first, and then the leaves would come out. Okay, and so Jesus comes to this fig tree, and it's got leaves, but it doesn't have any fruit. Should have had fruit, because the leaves are already there. But it, wasn't, it didn't have any fruit, it wasn't bearing fruit, okay? 
And so Jesus curses it because, again, the, there's a lesson here. There's a, this is symbolic. Is it a metaphor? Yeah. Basically, what he's saying is he's looking at it. Okay, so we have leaves on the tree, but there's no fruit. Leaves on the tree, but no fruit. There should be fruit, but there's not any fruit. Just the leaves, right? So he's saying this show of leaves is symbolic of Israel's profession of their faith. So they make a show. Oh, yeah, we love the Lord. We're faithful to God, and we do all the stuff that we're supposed to do. And we make a show of it, but what? Yeah, are they actually bearing fruit? No, they're not. So, yeah, it's all fake. It's all phony. It's all skin deep. There's nothing below the surface. Again, it's like you and me. I can walk around all day long saying, oh, I love Jesus. I love the Lord. But if I don't live for him, if my actions, I say that, but I don't live it, have I borne fruit? Now, I've got the leaves for show. I show off like, oh, look, look at me. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a righteous man. And then I go out and I'm drinking and cussing and doing all the kind of stuff that everybody else does. I'm not bearing any good fruit whatsoever. I just say that I'm a Christian. Well, anybody can say that. Do you live it, right? So he's saying, oh, the Israelites, the, the Jews here, they claim to be faithful servants of God, but they're not. Just all you got to look at is the example in the temple. Look what they're allowing to go on in the temple. Nobody's protesting. Nobody's saying anything against it. Why have the Pharisees kicked these guys out? Jesus is like, why do I have to come to town to deal with this? You guys should have already kicked them out of here, but you don't care. You just you run your mouth about how wonderful you are, but you don't really do anything. You know, So your life is featuring. You've got the show of leaves, but there's you've got to be bearing fruit, and you're not bearing any fruit. Okay, so that, that's kind of what he's trying to get us here. And so he's he curses the fig tree and it withers away. So again, people, ah, that's really kind of harsh, isn't it? To, to get mad at this poor tree. But again, the tree was not bearing fruit. That's its job. That tree is supposed to bear fruit. And it isn't. So it's not doing the one main thing it's supposed to be doing, providing food for people. And so think about Israel. So Jesus is saying, okay, because the nation of Israel is unfruitful, you put on a good show, but you're not really doing anything, what is God going to do to them? Yeah. Like the fig tree, they're going to wither away. God is going to punch them. The destruction of Jerusalem is going to happen in AD 70. So Jesus, he's kind of forbid. He's like, you're just like this fig tree. And because the fig tree did not bear fruit like it's supposed to, you're supposed to be serving God, but you're not. You too are going to be cursed by God, just like I cursed this tree here. That's the whole point of what he was doing. Okay, so God is going to condemn Israel. God is going to cut them down, so to speak. So hold your place here. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Of course, we read this a while back, but it's been a while. Matthew chapter 3. And notice there in Matthew 3, look at verse 10. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's what's going to happen to Israel because they're not bearing fruit. So, again, think about if there are trees in our yard that are dead or what, what do you do to those trees? Usually the good idea is to cut them down. There's, there's one right now at, at Janice's parents' house. Uh, we still own the house, and, and it's dead, and it's really close to the telephone wires, the power lines. I told her, I said, we really, we've got to get somebody to come, utilities or somebody, we've got to cut that tree down. Because if a storm happens, that dead tree falls, it's going to pull all the wires down, it could catch the house on fire. If a tree's dead, it's not really doing you any good, so you might as well just cut it down. Okay? 
And so God is saying the same thing about so-called followers of his. If they're really not producing good fruit, they're going to be cut down. Now, you're not doing the thing that you should be doing, what you're supposed to be doing when you claim that you're a follower of God. Okay? And so that's kind of the symbolism here of the fig tree. Jesus, again, is condemning the Jews for their lack of, you're not producing any good fruit. You're talking a good game, but you can't back it up. And unless you repent, and they're not, most of them are not going to repent. He knows that, of course. So he's like, well, then you're going to be cut down. That's what's going to happen to you. Okay? Same thing for you and me. If we don't bear good fruit, we're going to be condemned. We're going to be judged on the day of judgment, whether we bore fruit according to this book. For, for us to say it and not do it is not going to be good enough. We're going to be judged on not, well, we're going to be judged on our words too, but, but especially on our actions, what we do or what we fail to do uh, as children of God. So in verses 21 and 22, then again, the, the apostles, they marvel at this. And, wow, look at what he was able to do there. And so he's basically telling them that things that seem impossible, nothing is impossible with God. You've got to have enough faith, and if we trust in God, if we have a mature faith, nothing is impossible with God. So hold your place here. Turn over to Philippians 4 and 13. This is a good verse for us to know, and it's a good verse to remind ourselves of, especially in times of trouble, when we're down, when we're weak, when, when things seem to be going against us. This is a good verse to kind of remind yourself of. Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We need to seek out our Lord and Savior for strength, even in the good times too, but especially in those times when everything seems to be beating us down and going against us. Remind ourselves, hey, I'm on God's side. As long as I'm with him and he's with me, and I'm going to get through this. It may be a little painful for a while, it may not be joyful to go through, but God's going to get me through it. And we need to remind ourselves of that. And so he's trying to tell the apostles that those things that seem impossible, nothing's impossible with God. Have faith, have trust, and things will go the way they need to go. Now, we get to uh, verse 22. And this is what a lot of people really misinterpret this because they read into it what they want to read into it. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Okay? So what do you think a lot of people, what do they read out of that verse? Everything you ask for. Yeah. So if I pray to God today for, for him to put $20 million in my bank account, he's going to do that, right? Yeah. And when he doesn't do it, then I lose my faith in God. Well, I asked for $20 million, he didn't give it to me. Well, the Bible says that whatever I ask for, God's going to give me. Is that really what it says? Yeah. You, you've got to have the right attitude, and it does depend on what you're at. Why am I asking for $20 million? That's for me. I'm not asking so I can serve God better. I'm asking for me because I want a yacht or whatever. Right? So what, why am I asking? What am I asking for? And why am I asking for it? Right? So but people see this, oh, well, if you just you ask God, he'll, he'll do whatever. Or it might be to heal a disease. And, and when it doesn't get healed, well, why didn't God hear my prayer? Why didn't he, listen? Why didn't he cure my cancer? Why didn't he cure my heart disease or, or whatever? Or why did he let somebody die in that car wreck? You know, we, you get all this kind of stuff. And, well, I, I prayed for those people to be protected, and then they, they died in a, in a car crash. And why did God let that happen? It says here he's going to give me everything I asked for. That's not really what it says. Okay, but that's what a lot of people read into it. Okay, what we want to notice is that there are conditions for prayer. Conditions for prayer. Okay, because he says, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Okay, so believing, in other words, that that he doesn't mean just believing in God, but he means you're obedient to God. You're faithful to God. 
And so if you are, and you know the scriptures, then you know how God operates. Okay, and so I would know God's not going to give me $20 million miraculously just because I asked for it. He may believe I don't need it. I think I need it, but that doesn't mean he thinks I need it. And if I really trust in God, then what do I need to believe when I pray? His will. Yeah. He'll do what's best for me, not necessarily what I think, but he will do what. Well, God didn't answer my prayer. Yeah, he did. He just didn't answer it the way you wanted it answered. Okay, so, but Jesus said, if you believe, then God's going to answer your prayer. One way or another, he, he's going to answer it, okay? Uh, but there are conditions about this. But when he says, ye shall receive, that doesn't mean always I'm going to get what I ask for. What do you think it means I will receive? What I need. What I need, which might be the same thing I asked for, but it might not. Okay, so in other words, he's saying, God will answer your prayer. You're going to receive an answer. And whatever it is you receive, chances are it's probably going to be better than what you asked for. Because God knows better what I need. And you, somebody might go, well, how can anything else be better than $20 million? Simple. What if God gave you that $20 million? Yeah, just a lot of friends, yeah, a lot of phony friends, right? No. Like, like the prodigal son until the money runs out. <laughs> but what could happen to me if I get the $20 million? Change. It might change me for the worse. I might get arrogant. I might decide to spend that money on sinful things. You know, money, we, we talked about money in itself is not evil, but the love of money is. And so if I get a lot of that money dumped in my bank account, God might know that I wouldn't handle that too well. I think, well, I'll be fine. That's what we all say. But God might know, eh, you really don't need $20 million. That's going to corrupt you. That's, that's not the bet. But here's what you need, and this is what I'm going to give you. So if I'm faithful to God, he's going to answer, hear my prayer, answer my prayer, and I'm going to receive an answer. I may not receive what I asked for, but whatever God gives me, it's going to be even better than what I asked for because it comes from his mind and he knows what's best for me far better than what I think is best for me. Okay? And there have been plenty of things I look back on my life that I prayed for and I didn't get. And you know what? It turned out to be a blessing. When I look back on it and go, boy, I'm glad I didn't. I really thought that's what I wanted, but that wouldn't have been good for me. Well, see, God already knew that. God's like, no, I'm not, you're not getting that. You don't need that. <laughs> so I just need to have faith in him and trust in him. You know what, Lord? Whatever. It's okay to ask for things. That's, he's not saying you can't ask for anything. But, again, am I asking for selfish reasons or am I asking because this is going to be good for other people? you know, you got to look at those kind of things too. But, but look, here are some conditions of prayer that, that we need to meet. Okay, so condition number one, if you'll turn over to Mark chapter 11 and verse 25. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. First of all, prayer's got to be offered with a spirit of forgiveness. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. So again, the idea is if we're holding a grudge against somebody, if they've come to us for forgiveness, they've tried to make it right, we stubbornly won't. We can't do that. We have to be willing to forgive people. Okay? So that's one of the conditions we see here in Mark of, of prayer. You want your prayer heard, your heart's got to be in the right place, first of all. If I've got bad things in my life, then God's not going to listen to me. So I've got to take care of that. Okay? So that's one. Secondly, if you'll turn over to 1 John chapter 3, back toward the end of the New Testament. 1 Prayer is only effective if we keep God's commandments. Otherwise, again, he's not going to listen to us. Okay, so look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him 
because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So again, it says we receive of him. It means we're going to receive an answer. It may not be exactly what we asked for. But if we are faithful, if we are righteous, if our attitude is correct, if we are obeying his commandments, we will understand that when we go to God in prayer. And we will, I always try to put it in mind that when, if I do ask for something, I always try to put in there, but Lord, thy will be done, not mine. So I'm telling him, I'm submitting to him. Yeah, I know I'm asking you for this, but God, if you know this is not the best thing, then don't give it to me. Give me whatever it is you think would be better for me. I, I'm trusting in him rather than trusting in myself. And, and that's what, and I didn't always do that in my life, but hopefully that's what we're doing, right? But he tells us here, we've got to keep his command. We've got to be faithful and obedient to him if we want him to hear our prayers, okay? Now, we also see this idea in James chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. And this is the key. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's a very well-known verse. We quote that one quite a bit. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, what does that mean about the prayer of an unrighteous man? It's not a cause. I'm going to hear it. Okay? So a lot of people, again, they, they claim, oh, well, I love the Lord, but then they live their life the way they want to live it, and then they get mad because they think God's not listening to their prayers. I'm like, well, he probably not listening to your prayers because you're not living for him. That doesn't mean we've got to be perfect and we never make a mistake, but I'm saying we are every day, we're diligently trying to live for God, and if we do mess up, we repent, we fix it, and we go on, those prayers will be heard from those people. But if I'm just living my life for myself and I'm not really doing what God wants me to do and then I get in trouble and I pray to him and I expect him to bail me out, it's not going to happen. So unrighteous people, their prayers are not heard. So you, you've got to be striving diligently every day. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but you're striving and God knows you're doing your very best to live the way he wants you to live. He's going to hear your prayer. Okay, but if you're not doing that, then he's not going to hear it. And then number three, as we've always said, stay there in 1 John, or go back to 1 John. Look at chapter 5. It must be according to his will, not our will, but his. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. So in other words, you know, we're praying that his will be done. He's going to answer our prayers in the way that benefits us the most, even if we don't see it. Even if I think, well, I thought that would really benefit me. He knows better than I do because he knows what's going to happen in the future and I don't. And so like I said, I, I know with my life, maybe some of yours too, there are things I've prayed for in the past that I really thought I wanted and I didn't get it, but it turned out to be a blessing that my life didn't go in that direction. So God knows what he's doing. Ask for things, but always include you want God's will to be done, whatever that is. Okay? And then those fervent prayers will be answered. So this doesn't mean God's going to give us everything we ask for. I'm going to get all the money I want or, you know, whatever. But he's going to give us what he knows is best for us. So do we trust him or do we put our faith in ourselves? Well, I, not, well, I know what's better for me, Lord. What do you know? Or do we have the attitude of God? You know what's best. Just do what you think I need. That's what I'm asking you to give me. Those are the proper types of prayers. Okay? All right, any questions or comments? What time is it? It's after 15 after, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll be glad to get this thing fixed. I get everything's blurry. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to, uh, then we'll begin our worship service here.